Okay, well, it's an enormous pleasure to be here today. Thank you very much, Verna, for inviting me. Um, I'm a cancer cell biologist, so what I know about cancer comes from working in a lab, so I feel completely out of my depth here. So I've taken a lot of advice from Verna about what I should talk about, what might be of interest to you. So I really hope that um, I've targeted it correctly. And Verna's very kindly offered to help me out with the questions at the end, in case you ask me stuff that is way outside my remit. OK. So conventional systemic anti-cancer therapy, conventional chemo, is been around for, for many, many decades, as of course you're all aware. And generally, the way that it works is lots of different cancer chemotherapy drugs. But they usually work by either um, attacking regulatory mechanisms of the cell cycle, or more commonly, actually damaging the DNA, so that cells that are going through the cell cycle um, can't survive and die. So basically, they're, they're, they're working by targeting cancers that are undergoing active cell division. So the concept is that if you've got a cancer, if you've got a tumor, that at any one time there'll be a population of cells that are undergoing the cell cycle, undergoing cell division, and those cells will be attacked and will be killed. But of course, most of the cells won't be undergoing the cell cycle. And that's why, obviously, we need to give repeated cycles of chemotherapy to damage the next cycle of cells that are going into the cell cycle and so on. The other problem is that, of course, it's not just cancer cells that potentially are undergoing the cell cycle in our bodies. Normal cells are doing that too. And of course, there's therefore lots of collateral damage. Lots of normal cells get targeted, get killed. And that accounts for some of the really unpleasant side effects of a lot of conventional chemotherapies. Of course, also, over time, um, the cancer cells that are exposed to these drugs, uh, some of them will survive and will develop resistance and will give rise to progeny that are resistant to that drug. So over time, the, the tumor becomes resistant, and we have to think of another way of doing it. So there's lots and lots of problems with conventional uh, chemotherapy. And so it's really exciting time at the moment when there's lots of new, more targeted, more specific drugs coming online that hopefully will be better. So the idea of targeted systemic anti-cancer anti treatments are that we need to really understand in detail the molecular biology of the cancer so that we can pick specific targets that are actually specific to the cancer and you don't see in normal cells or are kind of more active in the cancer so that the normal cells and the rest of the body are spared uh, the effects. So the idea is that you get improved efficacy, improved tumor sensitivity, fewer side effects. And usually, um, these drugs work um, either by an indirect cytotoxic effect. They don't usually kill the cells directly, but they might <coughs> highlight to the immune system that these cells need killing and are be, uh, indirectly cytotoxic. Or more often, they're cytostatic. So they just stop the cells from continuing to divide and kind of put the tumor into stasis, into suspended animation, so that it doesn't progress. Now, in order to develop those kind of therapies, we need to have a really, really detailed understanding of the molecular biology of cancer. And for many, many decades, that just wasn't the case. So this slide is just capturing some of the early milestones in our understanding of cancer biology. And I'm sure you're familiar with these really classic stories. So the first suggestion, perhaps, that cancers could be caused by factors in the environment, environmental carcinogens, goes right back to the 1700s when Percival Pott, who was a, a GP a physician, um, noted that he was seeing a number of adult male patients with scrotal cancers, cancers of the skin surrounding the scrotum, which is a very unusual type of cancer. When he talked to these men, the thing that they had in common was that they'd all been chimney sweeps as boys. And he thought this was very curious. And he speculated that perhaps the reason why they got these cancers now as young adults was that in their childhood, when they'd been working as chimney sweeps, they'd had this chronic exposure to the soot uh, from, the, from the chimneys. And of course, people didn't wash themselves as often in those days as they do now. And so these boys would have had constant exposure of their skin to the soot. And certainly around their scrotum, the soot would be kind of encapsulated. And years later, they were developing these scrotal cancers. So it's an interesting hypothesis, and he's a clever man to sort of think of that. Then uh, a long time later, in 1915, Yamagiwa, a Japanese scientist, actually showed experimentally that that was the case. And he did this amazing set of experiments. He was the most meticulous, patient, uh, obsessive scientist you can imagine. But he painted coal tar on the ears of rabbits for hundreds and hundreds of days, daily. 
And this is an incredibly long experiment. And after many, many, many hundreds of days, some of these rabbits developed skin cancers in their ears, very similar to the scrotal cancers in the chimney sweeps. And so this is experimental proof that Percival Potts' original hypothesis was true, that there was something in soot, there was something in coal tar that could cause, with chronic exposure, cancers to the skin. And of course, we know now what those chemical components are, and we know how they, how they act. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was an enormous interest in radiation. Marie Curie uh, was a real pioneer in this uh, area. She was the first person to isolate and describe radioactive elements. She described polonium in 1898, and she's probably much more famous for describing radium, which at the time, these things were magical elements. They had these amazing powers, and nobody realized they were dangerous, of course. And so radium, for example, um, was considered to be a wonder thing. Uh, you could buy face cream with radium in it because it was so good for your complexion. So, and of course, radiation is a double-edged sword as far as cancer is concerned. We can use it for therapy, but at the same time, it causes cancer by damaging DNA. And there's some terribly sad stories about the first uh, radiotherapists, first people treating cancer with radiation, who themselves developed cancers and died as a result of the radiation that they were exposed to because it wasn't realized how dangerous it was. And of course, Marie Curie herself, tragic story, died of leukemia because of her lifelong exposure to radiation <coughs> as a result of her work. And I believe her grave is still radioactive from the radiation that her body absorbed during her lifetime. Moving on to the sort of early years of the 1900s, we became interested in the idea that viruses might be associated with cancer. And the first indication of this was from Peyton Roos, who was, uh, again, a GP, a uh, general practitioner. He, um, one, of, one of the farmers in his district came to him with a chicken he was worried about. And this chicken had a sarcoma, a muscle tumor in its breast. And Roos was really interested in this and he dissected the tumor and he made extracts from it. And he filtered these extracts to increasingly fine filters, and he showed that these extracts could cause sarcomas in other chickens, even the extracts that had been filtered through these incredibly fine filters. So he hypothesized that there must be an infective agent, and the infective agent must be something terribly, terribly tiny, and it must be a virus. And of course now we know that a lot of viruses are, can cause cancer or can contribute to the cause of cancer. I suppose one of the most well-known ones, human papillomavirus, associated with um, cervical cancers and, and other types of cancer. Finally, for this slide, Sir Richard Doll, who was one of the workers who first showed there was an association between smoking and lung cancer. Sir Richard Doll was based here in Oxford, and um, during my first years at Oxford Brookes University, he came and lectured to my students many, many times on this topic. He was the most incredible person. And he said the reason he got interested was because in the early years of the 1900s, um, lung cancer was rare. It was unheard of. And then suddenly in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, the rate started to absolutely rocket and the medical profession became very worried. They didn't know what was causing it. And he and some co-workers started to look for potential causes. And he said, you know, smoking was way down our list. How could it have been smoking? Not everybody gets lung cancer, but everybody smokes. And so they didn't think it was going to be smoking. He said he was more uh, convinced that it would be something to do with motor cars or tar in the roads or something like that because those were developments at the time. But he very soon realized that there was this really strong relationship between people who smoked getting lung cancer and people who didn't smoke being spared it. And of course now, again, we know in great detail, as with the viruses, as with the radiation, as with the carcinogens in soot, exactly what is causing the cancer, how it's uh, acting at a molecular level, and how, how these things happen. And in fact, over the last 20 or 30 years, there's been this extraordinary explosion in our knowledge of the detailed molecular biology of cancer. It's been a very, very exciting time to be a cancer cell biologist. And this has largely been um, made possible by huge advances in laboratory techniques, in molecular biology techniques. We can do things now that were absolutely undreamed of even 10 years ago, even five years ago. It's really, really accelerating. And it's meant that we now understand cancer biology in incredible detail. And in the year 2000, Hannah Hannah Weinberg, who are two American oncologists, uh, wrote this really seminal review paper where they pulled together all of our rapidly advancing knowledge about the molecular biology of cancer. And they said, we can really capture what is different about cancer cells under these six hallmarks of cancer and they're illustrated in this diagram. And by understanding them, we can start to develop more specific targeted therapies to try and 
interfere with those poor marks. So starting at the bottom, enabling replicative mortality. Normal cells can only go through a certain number of cell divisions and then they senesce and then they die. They commit suicide by apoptosis because they have at the end of their chromosomes, telomeres, little um, expanses of, of DNA. And every time they go undergo a, a cycle of cell division, the telomeres shorten slightly. And when the telomeres are gone, they can't divide anymore. So normal cells are mortal. They only have a certain life, start, start, uh, life span. Cancer cells, on the other hand, activate something called telomerase that builds those telomeres back up again. And so they're immortal. They can carry on dividing forever and ever and ever. One of the ways that we can target that is use telomerase inhibitors to stop them doing that. So moving uh, clockwise around the, around, the, around, the, around the diagram, another um, hallmark of cancer is that they're able to induce angiogenesis, the, the development of new blood vessels. So any group of, of cells can't get more than about two millimeters in diameter without stimulating its own blood supply, bringing it oxygen and nutrients and taking away waste products. And angiogenesis in the adult human body is really, really closely controlled. But cancer cells learn to switch on angiogenesis. They learn to encourage blood vessels to grow towards them and feed them, to bring them nutrients, to bring them oxygen, and to allow them to grow bigger. So again, that gives us a, a key to how we might be able to tackle cancer. We can develop anti-angiogenic drugs to stop them doing that. And a good example is Avastin, which is an anti-vascular endothelial growth factor monoclonal antibody that targets one of the key players in angiogenesis so that the cancer cells can't do that. Resisting cell death. Um, if the cells are damaged, their DNA is damaged, they receive signals that says, you need to kill yourself because you, you're, you're too damaged. Cancer cells overcome those signals, they ignore them, and they just carry on dividing, no matter how badly damaged their DNA is, no matter how many mutations they acquire. And again, we can uh, target that hallmark of cancer, for example, uh, an example given here, the BH3 only protein mimetics that target pro-survival genes. and inactivate them so that the cancer cells have to respond to the signals to say, you must kill yourself because you're damaged. I'm not going to talk about sustaining proliferative signaling right now because I'm going to give you some specific examples and stories around that in a moment. So moving on to cycling, to evading growth suppressors. Again, um, normal cells respond to signals that say, that group of cells is big enough now, you mustn't go on dividing any longer. Cancer cells are able to evade those signals, to ignore them, and to carry on dividing. And again, we can target that hallmark using things like cyclin dependent kinase inhibitors so that the cancer cells start to respond to those signals appropriately. Finally, for these hallmarks, activating invasion and metastasis. Of course, that's really what is the big problem with, with cancer. Often, it's not such a problem to deal with a primary tumor. It can often be remo removed by surgery, for example. But by the time that happens, in all too many cases, of course, the cancer has metastasized. It's spread to other parts of the body. And those disseminated tumors are often uh, what the real problem is as far as the patient is concerned and, and dividing appropriate therapy. And at the moment, um, probably the majority of metastatic disease is still targeted by conventional chemotherapy drugs with all of the inherent uh, problems. So I'm just going to take one of those hallmarks, the sustaining proliferative signaling, and talk a little bit in more depth about some of the developments um, in targeted systemic uh, therapy that have been focused on that particular hallmark. So first of all, what is meant by sustained proliferative signaling? Well, this diagram shows the concept of signaling cascades. So here's a normal cell. And on the surface, you've got receptors <coughs> that are growth factor receptors. So they sit there waiting to receive a signal. If a growth factor comes into contact with the receptor, it will signal to the receptor, switch the receptor on, and the receptor will pass that signal across the plasma membrane into the cytoplasm and pass it on to a signaling enzyme. That signaling enzyme will get switched on, will pass the signal on. The next uh, link in the chain will be activated, will pass the signal on, and so on, until it finally reaches the nucleus, where transcription factors are activated, the DNA is replicated, and the cell is um, sent to, to is caused to divide. So one of the things that this um, <coughs> diagram doesn't uh, really illustrate very well is that at each stage in the, in the cascade, 
one signaling molecule actually signals to 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 signaling molecules at the next step. And each of those 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 signal to another 100 or 1,000 or 10,000. And so the signal gets amplified by the time it reaches the nucleus. So a very tiny signal at the cell surface can have a huge effect. The signaling enzymes themselves are often tyrosine kinases. So the idea of tyrosine kinases are they're proteins that, um, when they're activated, they receive a molecule of ATP, an energy packet, and that activates them, it switches them on, and it enables them to pass the signal on to the next um, player in the cascade. What happens in cancer cells is that things go wrong with these signaling pathways. They're normally terribly well regulated, but in cancers, what can happen is sometimes that you have lots and lots and lots of receptors on the cell surface. That gene is upregulated and they're overexpressed. So the cell is terribly, terribly sensitive to those signals. Sometimes those signal, those receptors are constitutively switched on. So they're always passing the signal into the rest of the cascade, even though they haven't um, received a signal from a growth factor. And also the downstream players. The signaling enzymes sometimes are overexpressed or are sometimes mutated, so they're constitutively uh, switched on. So what you often get in cancer cells is these hyperactive pathways where all of the time the signal is being sent to the cell to divide and divide and divide. Now some specific examples of those cell surface growth factor receptors, like epidermal growth factor receptor and HER2, which are really big players in the cancer biology story. So they're growth factor receptor tyrosine kinases, just like we just uh, described in that hypothetical pathway. And epidermal growth factor receptor is overexpressed in lots of different types of cancer, so colorectal, head and neck, uh, norm, non Non Sorry, <laughs> non small cell lung cancer and uh, gastric cancers. And HER2 is overexpressed in a lot of breast cancers. So, of course, we can immediately think of ways that we can target that signaling cascade. We use monoclonal antibodies that are directed against HER2 or the epidermal growth factor receptor. The monoclonal antibody will bind to the receptor and therefore block the growth factor from binding and therefore potentially block the cascade from being um, stimulated. So here's a much more complex diagram showing this cascade, but the, the principles are exactly the same as the simpler diagram I showed you a moment ago. So here's the epidermal growth factor receptor in the cell membrane. Here's the HER2 receptor in the cell membrane. And they, when they are activated by the binding of their respective growth factors, two molecules of epidermal growth factor or two molecules of HER2 dimerize. They come together and that's part of their kind of activation. They take uh, up uh, energy from ATP, their uh, tyrosine kinases, they get switched on and then they activate this immensely complicated pathway with lots and lots of downstream players. Um, so one of the ways that we can um, stop that from happening in cancers where these um, growth factor receptors are upregulated, where there's lots of them on the cell surface, is we can use monoclonal antibodies directed against them. And as I just said, the monoclonal antibody binds to the cell surface growth factor uh, receptor and stops the growth factor from binding so that the signal cascade isn't activated. Or we can use tyrosine kinase inhibitors that compete with the ATP, the energy um, giving molecule, so that um, the growth factor receptor doesn't get that boost of energy so the signal can't be um, passed further on. And in fact, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, as well as monoclonal antibodies, have been very helpful in blocking these types of signaling pathways. So tyrosine kinase inhibitors have been useful in um, treating non-small cell lung cancer. The traditional old-fashioned treatment for this was very much a uh, combination classical chemotherapy. But um, a great number of people, up to about a third of people in non-small cell lung cancer, have um, mutations in the epidermal growth factor receptor and so tyrosine kinase inhibitors have been very very helpful in treating this type of uh, cancer. The patients respond very well and actually their survival is better than with conventional chemotherapy so that this is really taken over now as um, a first-line therapy for people with this particular type of mutation and this particular type of cancer. So our thoughts about 
the molecular biology of cancer are getting increasingly complex. And there's really this rather exciting idea that perhaps in the not too distant future we might have kind of personalized medicine. Uh, this kind of around this idea of theranostics, therapy specific to diagnostics, rather than say this woman has breast cancer or this man has a colorectal cancer or this woman has a malignant melanoma, we might say this person has a tumor that has a mutation in their epidermal growth factor receptor, therefore this particular type of therapy would be most appropriate for that person. And then when that tumor becomes resistant to that particular line of therapy, we can look at the specific molecular biology of that person's tumor once again and say, well, what's the next target that we can define based on their specific molecular biology? This cascade here is um, showing uh, molecular pathways in non-small cell lung cancer, and it's showing the concept that already uh, in these different complex pathways, there are agents that have been um, already approved for therapy. They're the ones given in red, targeting a couple of different players in the pathway. But also the ones in green are where there are targets or uh, drugs, new, new therapies already under development. So that eventually you can imagine that you'd have many, many lines of defense against a tumor that is, has mutations, has activations in this particular type of signaling cascade. So it sounds wonderful. But, of course, it's not as simple and it isn't as wonderful as that. It's not a magic solution. Uh, and an example of where some of the problems arise come from looking at, looking at RAF and MEK mutations in malignant melanoma. So here's another signaling cascade, uh, similar sort of concept to the ones that I've shown already. You've got a tyrosine kinase receptor in the cell, surface, in the cell membrane. Uh, it responds to a growth factor to a growth factor by sending the signal across into the cytoplasm and then this very very complex downstream cascade ultimately leading to the DNA being replicated and the cell undergoing cell division. We find in melanomas that about half of them have mutations in one of the key players in that pathway, RAF here, and when it's mutated RAF is referred to as BRAF. So we can use BRAF um, inhibitors and we can also use inhibitors of the next two players in the cascade, MEK and ERK, to try and block signaling in metastatic melanomas that, ha that have mutations in this particular pathway. And they work. And they work brilliantly, but they work for a very short time. So um, inhibitors of BRAF work really, really well, but <coughs> patients typically acquire resistance to them within about six months of the therapy. Um, MEK and ERK inhibitors also work really well, and they work particularly well in combination with BRAF inhibitors. But again, in a really short period of time, over just a few months, patients typically develop resistance to them. So in, in theory, this is a wonderful approach, but in practice, there are still, still problems. And in this lovely quote here from MacArthur last year, we're certainly not done yet as far as these sorts of therapies are concerned, although they show immense promise. So what we need to do, really, is overcome that issue of resistance, understand these molecular pathways better, uh, develop more and more systemic drugs against the different players in the pathway, such that once uh, a patient's tumor has developed resistance to one uh, approach, we can then hit it with another one targeting a different aspect of those very, very complex signaling cascades. In 2011, Hannah Hannah and Weinberg updated their seminal review and they said, actually, we've just learned so much in the last 10, 11 years. And there's another couple of hallmarks that we think are emerging hallmarks that are starting to become important and also enabling characteristics, things that enable cancers uh, to do what they do. So the enabling characteristics they named were tumor promoting inflammation. We know an environment full of inflammatory cytokines is really positive for a cancer. It gets signaling to the cancer that it, uh, it can grow and divide. And gen genomic instability and mutation. Cancer cells become very, very genetically unstable such that they can evolve very, very fast to outwit our attempts to, to, to treat them. The emerging hallmarks were deregulating cellular energetics and avoiding immune destruction. And I'm just highlighting avoiding immune destruction because there's some really interesting work looking at new therapies, perhaps targeting that emerging hallmark of cancer. So 
Targeting immune checkpoint receptors it seems to be uh, a field that is emerging that is looking very, very promising indeed. And this table just uh, gives some examples of some monoclonal antibodies that are targeting this emerging hallmark of cancer, the um, immune checkpoints. And they seem at an early stage now to be very, very promising. So for tumors resistant to the newer targeted therapy, perhaps using older cytotoxic drugs, in combination with some of the newer therapies and in combination with these checkpoint receptors um, seems to be um, uh, a very positive um, way forward. And I know the next speaker is going to talk about that, so I won't say anything further about it. Okay, that's it. So, um, <laughs> Thank you, Susan. That was excellent. Thank so you very much. Maybe we'll agree that section. I'm going to come stand by you so I can come on to the mic um, for lecture capture purposes. Absolutely. Um, so um, is there anyone in the audience that have got any questions at all? Um, I couldn't give you any figures. But I think one of the things that's very positive is that if you think about the Human Genome Project, which I think was around about the year 2000, um, sequencing the first human genome was, I mean, an unbelievably colossal and expensive undertaking. It took many, many researchers in many, many centers, many, many years, and I mean, unbelievable amounts of money. We can now do that sort of work for an absolute fraction of the cost and actually quite simply. So the technology, the molecular biology techniques have advanced just in the last 15 years, absolutely astronomically. You can't believe how much they've come on and how much they've got cheaper. So it's like, you know, when the first, first uh, digital watches were invented, they cost hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds and now they give them away with petrol. You know, and I think it's going to be like that. But at the moment, it's probably unrealistic. But who knows what it'll be like in five years' time or ten years' time because the field is just advancing so fast. So I would hope that actually the sequencing part of it certainly would become cheap and um, practical in the not too distant future. And, and just following on from that, in terms of the um, production of the drugs and getting them to patients, um, I think one of the things that there has been a massive cost implication with the targeted drugs around the research and development, but also with the monoclonal antibodies, because they are a biological um, molecule, you do need to have a, a different science and teams of scientists to generate that molecule. You need a complete extra level of quality assurance. So they are much more expensive to produce. Um, I was talking to somebody that works for Amgen on Tuesday, and they were talking about a new oncolytic um, in Ligic. And they were telling me that every single vial that they will have of this new therapy, they have to keep, and they have to, I think they have to go through seven months of testing for quality assurance on each and every individual vial. It makes them enormously expensive and we do have these high cost drugs and I don't know if Nicola wants, Nicola's in the audience at the moment, I don't know if you want to say anything about what's happening now about the new approvals for NICE and CDF or whether you'll talk about that later. Yeah, so Nicola, Nicola will be talking about that later because so, it's a real issue but you know it's great to have these therapies but they the high cost to do the R&D. Um, and so do you, do you know what's coming through in terms of the scientific development about our better understanding about the switching to anaerobic metabolism? No, I don't, to be honest. Um, I think, again, it's a very, very interesting idea that the cancer cells are just working in a very, very diff different way to the normal cells. I don't know if you... <laughs> I won't make you speak anymore. So, so something that, that cancer cells can do is, is, um, is this Warburg effect. So they are able to survive even in a hypoxic environment. Um, and that's where you can see tumours that, you, you know, some tumours that are large. You might have the cells at the centre of the tumour that have necrosed and died and others where their you know, cells are vibrant and then they switch their metabolism. So it might be that, you know, with better understanding, and I know that there are some teams working on this, that they're actually... There are um, drugs that might target that and prevent cancer cells from being able to switch into an anaerobic respiration pathway, so that when they become hypoxic, they will die. So, so I think that you know, now that we've got a much better understanding of the biology of cancer, we can start targeting lots of different mechanisms. So.
That's great. Thanks ever so much. Thank you. Sorry about the coughing, Chris. <laughs>